Okay, so on Sunday evening, uh, we found out that Milei, Javier Milei, won the elections in Argentina in somewhat of a surprising term, uh, turn of events. However, it is also true that Argentina has essentially been in a constant crisis since about 2001. So the repetition of the same political formulas and figures has produced a form of exhaustion against the backdrop of a complete crisis, which does not necessarily have to do with poverty. Poverty in Argentina is mostly a constant, but I think the biggest factor in every crisis that has brought political volatility over this 22, 23 years has been actually the dissatisfaction of the middle class in city centers. So this is actually, in a sense, no different. What we have is essentially a very dissatisfied middle class which has actually produced also a very volatile political situation. Millet joins the political discussion with some truly, truly radical statements. So by the time he actually came into the political field, he had already several years behind him of uh, not so much punditry, but celebrity commentary on Argentinian TV. Uh, to understand really what kind of figure Millet is, one needs to have an understanding of the American media field that um, can best be described as a reproduction of the Italian media field under the auspices of the Berlusconi media set machine, in which a lot of the sort of um, cabaret and, and soap opera figures, as well as the football figures, have slowly but consistently ambled into the space of the political discussion, the intellectual discussion, and the social issue debate. This means that a lot of things that one would normally hear sort of in a changing room of a football stadium had become, through people like Millet, part of the general discussion of Argentina. Uh, in the privacy of their own homes, a lot of the Argentinian uh, middle class, I would say, uh, particularly the one that floats between the center left and the center right of Argentinian politics, has been increasing the level of vitriol against the Kirchner government, uh, which began essentially uh, around 2003, in which by 2007 turned into the Cristina uh, government. But this was essentially being discussed in the privacy of one's own home or in <coughs> discussions among friends in which colorful language, uh, especially in places like Argentina, usually get deployed. A lot of that, which was the kind of thing that one would say in the absolute privacy of one's home in the middle of like a drunk rant, uh, was actually now pouring into the airwaves and pouring into the public sphere. One of the things that became synonymous with Millet was the expression of fucking leftists. And this is actually a very rough translation of zurdo de mierda, uh, which is, you know, obviously a, an incredibly derogatory way to talk about an entire political field. And it really had a lot to do with this sort of Boca Riverismo that Argentina has, this football hooliganism approach to politics, of which I was talking about in a minute, pouring into the political discussion. Argentina has had a sort of agreement of, of uh, gentlemen, at least since 1983, with the return to democracy, that although vitriol was certainly a part of the political debate, there were certain lines that were not going to be crossed. One of the things that we began to see with people around Millet, and Viviana Canosa is a media figure in Argentina that can be singled out as somebody that brought this kind of thing onto, onto the public space, was actually the use not only of expletives, but actually the promise of enormous violence. The kind of violence that we have seen in the 70s and the early part of the 80s in Argentina. To certify his commitment to this kind of violence, Millet, during the campaign, chose as a vice presidential candidate a woman that has been essentially a defender and an apologist for the disappearance of the 30,000 people that the military whisked away between 1976 and 1983 in Argentina. So what this did uh, was essentially certify his very reactionary and very violent, uh, very violent credentials, which were the ones that he actually had himself repeated. 
Another very often very usual target for Millet, but very unusual for the general discourse of Latin American politics, was the Catholic Church. In a couple of occasions, uh, Millet took direct aim at the Pope, Argentinian himself, Bergoglio, essentially calling him first an imbecile. The imbecile in Rome was actually his statement made on TV in the television show of uh, Viana Canosa. And a bit later, he referred to him as uh, a representative of the Antichrist on Earth. And essentially, during that conversation, Millet showed a lot of the influence of evangelism and radical Protestantism in his approach to political discourse and political campaigning in Latin America. My assumption is that he had seen a very, very uh, successful use of these tropes in Bolsonaro in Brazil, who was broadly backed by the evangelical vote. And he thought that these were the kind of things that could actually help to build a big, big political tent in Argentina as well. So pulling people that normally would not be pulled together into a political system, he actually managed to use this, this this kind of language and this kind of statement to do so. Obviously, the absolute exhaustion of this vast part of the middle class, which had been essentially looking for things that they could not find, like political stability, like ways to basically acquire things and participate and compete in the international commodity markets and so on and so forth, were actually a very important contributing factor. However, what is obviously very important to underline is that Millet's position essentially remains one that is extremely, extremely radical, even by Argentinian standards, and it's a return to a type of politics that one would have thought and hoped that the region had abandoned, particularly Argentina, after 30,000 people killed. The people that came out to support Millet, 55% of the population, cannot be said necessarily to support the notion of violence or the project of violence against the left. However, it is true that these 55% have not been strangers to the kind of violence that has been implicit and that had been explicit in a lot of the discussion in Millet and in a lot of his public discourse and public assertions, and actually has taken the position that it can be tolerated uh, for the sake of a political... Okay, so let's talk about policies. Millet is promising to disassemble the National Bank. The problem, of course, with that is that the National Bank in Argentina is constitutionally mandated, and he would need to go through Congress, where he has no significant number of people to actually force a constitutional reform. Not only his group is minuscule, his allies are still a minority. These are the people around Macri, Macri's political party, the former president, also uh, a political and economic catastrophe. But in fact, he has been so brutal in his references to what now is his main opposition that it's very unlikely that they will be willing to look for a common ground with Millet. This means that essentially, at the level of Congress, his agenda will be completely stalled from day one. In the long run, there are a lot of items that would depend on Congress. And I think that because of the profile of Millet and the things that he has actually claimed in campaign, it would not be completely crazy to expect him to actually try to dissolve Congress in a kind of legislative presidentialist school. Now, this being the case, uh, what we are going to see is a country that becomes politically much more volatile very, very, very quickly. Uh, so there are other parts to his presumed political agenda. For instance, the disassembly of the state as the good libertarian or anarcho-libertarian, as he claims to be. So this is something that, you know, one can sing in places like Western Europe or one can sing in affluent cities in the U.S. But the fact is that not only a lot of Argentina is completely dependent on the good offices of the state, a lot of the um, productive apparatus of Argentina is completely dependent on the good offices of the state. Take, for instance, this. If you are actually are a worker in Chaco, in one of the lost, lost faraway provinces of Argentina where poverty is endemic, your very possibility of taking transportation is dependent on the state helping you to pay essentially international prices for the gas that the bus consumes. When the state pulls out that subvention in Argentina, the energy subventions are massive, uh, sorry, the water subventions, then you need to pay for that bus ticket in international dollar oil prices by yourself. 
If you're still earning Chaco salaries in pesos or even in dollars, that would be a very, very tall order. Not only this means that you will not be able to earn because you will not be able to get to your work, this also means that your employer will now be essentially deprived of workers because they cannot actually make it in. So the fact is that the entire machine of Argentina is dependent on a state that actually not simply greases the, 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 the gears, but as a matter of fact, essentially helps along because Argentina cannot actually compete internationally <clears throat> with the prices of commodities. Now, you have another element here, which is, I think, of great, great importance, which is if Argentina were indeed to dollarize and Argentina were indeed to deprive itself, deprive itself of the instrument to actually combat, for instance, an outside crisis with devaluation, devaluation of its currency, being able to print, essentially what it would mean is that it would become a faraway province of economic, of economic centers on which it has absolutely no influence. Think of the Greek economic crisis multiplied by a million, and then you have a picture of what is that Argentina could be facing. Now, if Argentina is a country that has great subvention and great participation of the state, it's not simply out of the bad ideological positioning of the left is also a function of a certain, not only political, but social necessity. Now, in addition to all of this, what we have is essentially a discourse or a type of uh, you know, conversation that essentially promises a serious slide back on democratic guarantees and on rights that had been essentially earned over the last 10, 15, 20 years. For instance, gay marriage, which he has promised to derogate. For instance, abortion rights, which he has also promised to derogate. All of these things actually belong to a certain way to dog whistle to his base. But at the same time, what is important to take into consideration is that these are central policy elements that actually define a lot of the relations that he has with other countries, other governments, and very often aid packages. One of the things that was discussed today in Politico, and I really invite you to read the piece on Millet, is that in Europe, the relation, the, 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 the cooperation between the EU, agreement EU, Latin America, particularly Argentina, Mercosur, is being essentially put on hold. It's essentially being restudied under the current condition. The issue is obviously not only Millet's policy positions, but it's the fact that what is about to happen is that Buenos Aires will have a massive ideological and economic split with Brazil. Brazil is a heavy hitter in the area. Bolsonaro has essentially disappeared. That was actually a complete collapse catastrophe. And now we have Lula again, who probably has absolutely no appetite to deal with somebody like Bolsonaro or the traditional Latin American far right. The impact geopolitically and geostrategically of this is that it basically it has a, a de facto effect of essentially breakdown or fracture inside the Mercosur. So the question in Europe, as it will be the question in the US, is okay, well, when we talk to the Mercosur, who are we talking to? And are they really capable of working with each other? My general answer to that would be no, probably not. Now, there is one more thing to be said, which is, if it were the case that next year Trump does not make it to the White House, and it were the case next year that, as a matter of fact, Europe does not go through a far-right wave of the type that, you know, Meloni and Orban and Le Pen would like to see, Argentina would be left in a very isolated position in relation to a Biden White House and essentially a type of von der Leyen Brussels. So yes, okay, they may could make friends with, say, Rome, if Meloni is still in position, but the fact is that that's not enough of a player geopolitically. So Millet also puts into question the international standing of Argentina. Now, today there were a few discussions about how well stocks have done since Millet's victory was announced. I invite you to go out and look at the reaction of the markets in the direct wake of Macri's victory uh, now, essentially, eight years ago. Everybody was still also very giddy and also very happy and exultant, and we all know how that story ended. 
So, okay, what is that is the upshot of all of this? Well, I think that obviously the position is wait and see, it should be wait and see, uh, because politics has a way of, you know, public administration has a way to sober those that are committed to politics. Uh, it's much easier to like stand on the stage and give great speeches than actually having to deal with, you know, the holes, the potholes on the road, uh, lighting on the other side of the country and the lack of sufficient education. So once you actually have to deal with, with these things, well, the political discourse actually is usually toned down. We actually did learn that in Rome with Meloni, right? She was against Draghi and then all she became Draghi uh, in many ways. But the fact is that even though we wait and see, I think that particularly Europe, and on the US, I don't generally count politically for Latin America, but particularly in Europe, there has to be a really strong commitment to pushing Argentina, the Millet government, to hold on and respect democratic guarantees, constitutional guarantees, and essentially the, um, the rule of law and the principle of civic order. This is really, more than anything else, as far as I'm concerned, the task at hand for European political institutions looking forward in Argentina. Because by doing that, they could also guarantee stability in the region at a time in which, well, I think that there are enough crises to actually deal with. Anyhow, this is the end of my video today. We'll talk again maybe in a couple of days. I'll see how this thing does. Nice to talk to you guys.